All right, uh, let's do the first worksheet. Uh, so we're talking about functions, and a function is something where each input has exactly one output. And we just have these input-output pairs. They don't have to be numbers, but that's what we're often going to look at in this class. So uh, here's a web work problem, and uh, it asks, is f a function of t? Okay, so in other words, of t, um, when we see of and then something, that something is our input. So we know this is our input row. And so then sort of by deduction or process elimination, really, uh, this must be our output row. So is big F a function of t? That's sort of what they're asking here. And we just have to go through and check. Does each input have exactly one output? Does 0 have one output? Yep. Does 1 have one output? Yep. Does 2 have one output? Yep. And you just go through the list, and it turns out, yes, this is a function. Okay? And you might um, overthink this and say, well, wait a second. 57 repeated? Yeah, but I don't care. Those are outputs. And um, what... The definition does not say, okay, so each input is paired with exactly one uh, unique output. If, if that word was there, then that would mean outputs were not allowed to repeat. But the fact that it's not there means we don't care if the output repeats, we just care that an input has one output. So let me give you an example of something that's not a function. We'll add another column, and I need to repeat an input, so I'm going to repeat one. Okay, Whoop. so now someone might ask, okay, what is f of 1? And, well, it would be nice to say it's 143, but if there's ambiguity here, if it was either 143 or 2, then this is not a function. There's not exactly one output that I can tell you that 1 is mapped to. So, um, functions, don't overthink them. It's just, if... If you give me an input, I had better be able to say what the output is. And if there's any ambiguity, it's not a function. Okay, that's essentially the idea. Um, now, uh, let's just work backwards for a moment and just do part B. So they say g of t is equal to 75, and we essentially need to find t. So we go through and we say, okay, well, here's 75, here's 75. And so it looks like this happens at t equals 4 and t equals 8. Okay, this is just sort of understanding this type of notation. Um, and, yeah, what it means to find the solutions. We're finding t in this case. All right. So um, we are very quickly going to stop using x and y in this class, and we're going to use all kinds of other names. Okay? So in words, uh, when you see the word of, the thing that follows of is the input. Okay? I, I wrote that and erased it up earlier. So this is asking, is x a function of y? So in other words, if you put a y value in, so let's look at this equation here, and let's solve for x, y squared minus 1. Okay, true or false, if you plug in a number for y, you will get exactly one number for x. And it's true. Um, we, can, we can graph this relationship where this is my y-axis now because that's my input. This is my x-axis now because that's my output. And this is a parabola. It's the input squared minus 1, so input squared, but then we have to shift it down 1. And this would pass the vertical line test, right? No matter where I draw a vertical line, it'll only intersect one time. And so that's a function. Um, now, if we switch x and y, so if I sort of look at this additional question that I wrote, and I say, is y a function of x? Well, then it's no longer true. And if I draw the graph, um, it'll look something like this, Whoop. okay? And now this is my x-axis, and this is my y-axis, and it's still this relationship. Um, it's just now who I'm thinking of as the input, right, is different. Now my input is x. And now I fail the vertical line test. I have two passes. And all that's saying is, let's pretend this red vertical line here is the line x equals 3. Okay, if I told you x equals 3, and then I ask you what is y, there's ambiguity there. Because we're trying to solve the equation y squared is equal to 3 plus 1. So that's 4. Okay, y squared equals 4. Well, there's two solutions. There's negative 2 and there's positive 2. So giving you x 
you cannot give me exactly one output for y. You cannot give me exactly one output. This is not a function. Uh, that is, y is not a function of x. But x is a function of y. So anyway, um, we sort of switched who the independent and dependent variables were. And the hint for that is the word of. All right, is student height a function of student name? OK, so is height a function of name? And the answer here is maybe. OK, you'd have to write a bit more to show that you fully understand. So um, suppose I have two students, both named Sam. OK, Sam. And then I ask you, how tall is Sam? You would probably look at me and you go, which one? <laughs> So if this Sam is five foot eight and this Sam is six foot two, well, which one? And that's the whole point. There's ambiguity here. This would not be a function because for the same name, we'd have different heights. We would have two outputs when we only have one input. That input was Sam. And even if there were last names, you could imagine a scenario where both of these students were Sam Smith, okay? Okay, I have two Sam Smiths. What's the height? Well, which one? Right? So <laughs> is student height a function of name? Maybe. I don't know. It depends. Do you have two students of the same height? With, I'm sorry. Do you have two students with the same name but different heights? Then there's ambiguity, and it's not a function. So, okay. Um, that being said, you know, this is how mathematicians think of functions. This is not how you have to think of a function for the vast majority of this class. Uh, this is sort of the week one. We're going to be super mathematical. So I say no one thinks of functions like this. I'm, I'm kind of lying a little bit. But the point is that in science, when you measure something, you sort of have two variables, right? You have your independent variable and you have your dependent variable. And this is something that you either tweak or like it's time, so it's being tweaked for you. And then this is something that you measure. Okay? And... Your measuring device, for it to be any good, had better give you one well-defined answer. If I'm curious how tall I am, and I stand up against a measuring device, and that measuring device says, well, you're five foot eight, um, or you're six foot two, I'd be like, this is a useless device, right? The reality is that when you conduct your experiments, you sort of naturally make functions uh, because you're going to measure something and, and have an unequivocal measurement result, and that's your output. So anyway, uh, all right. Oh, and I should say, so this activity comes from the textbook, um, section 1.2, activity 1. Uh, this comes from the web work, and when I highlight these things, I'm sort of trying to give you hints at like stuff that might appear on a quiz um, or quiz adjacent. So anyway, uh, okay. Let's try Webbook 1, question 6. So this is a really wordy one, which is why I did not um, include it. You can look it up. Um, I'll give you mine, uh, part A at least. This is a uh, four-part question. So my part A, um, so there's sort of this parent part of the question, which says that f of t denotes the number of people, number of people, uh, eating in a restaurant uh, t minutes after 5 p.m., Okay, so number of people eating, we have T minutes after 5 p.m. Okay, fine. So part A, which of the following statements best describes the significance of the expression F of 3 is equal to 13? Okay, well, let's just break it down. Um, so, uh, da -da -da -da, what do I want to say? Of people eating in the restaurant, T minutes. <laughs> oh, of course, of course, of course. Sorry, so something that I've been telling you all, I, I said that what falls the word of is typically the input. And of course, this is, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, let me read this parent sentence again that I kind of abbreviated. Um, uh, in fact, let me just sort of rewrite it and say it slower. So F of T denotes <laughs> the number of people eating in a restaurant after, um, or T minutes, sorry, T minutes, 
after 5 p.m. Okay, but here we have other context clues. The fact that this t is in here is telling us that's the independent variable. So this three in here is saying three minutes after 5 p.m. Oh, by the way, you should totally look at your web work question six, okay, um, for this to make sense. Yours is going to be something very similar. Your numbers are going to be a little different. This first sentence is likely the same for all of us. Um, anyway, so uh, this is the equation I have, and it means three minutes after 5 p.m., there are 13 people, people uh, eating in the restaurant. Okay, so anyway, understanding the meaning of the relationship is much more important for science than understanding the mathematical definition of function, uh, in my opinion. All right, so that's what a function is. Um, I, well, whatever. All right, so then there's this notion of domain and range, and I don't really want to harp on this because it's not going to be harped on much later on in the class. So before we look at that, let's just look in the real world when you have a model. Okay, so I'm going to model fish population, and here it is. So what's T? It's the number of years since 2020. Okay, what's the initial population of fish? Well, that would happen when T is equal to zero. So we plug in zero and we get 500 because uh, 1.2 to the zero power is equal to one, so it's just 500. Okay, um, that's fine. We're not talking about domain and range yet. Let's see, as a scientist, what values of T are allowed? Well, let's see, T is a number of years since 20. I don't see any reason to, uh, to stop. So I suppose T could be anything from zero and just keep on going. Okay, fine. So um, that, I mean, sure. But also, like, models eventually you're going to run out. So maybe in the real world, you might say that this model is only good only for, let's say, from zero for the next 10 years. Okay. This is an example of a domain. It's the set of allowable inputs. Okay, these are the allowable inputs. And in life, in science, that's going to be dictated by your model. In math, if I just look at this and think like a mathematician, then this is my domain. Technically speaking, there's no reason to stop at 10. You can just let t keep on growing. Okay. But the idea of domain is just what's your allowable inputs. And in the real world, when you're making models and stuff, it'll be determined by your model. Okay, so uh, mathematically speaking, what's the domain? Well, so, all right, right. So this is sort of what I was getting at. Sorry, as a scientist, what values is here allowed? It just sort of depends on how long your model is good for. Um, you might plug in, you know, t equals 100. And, oh, let me just do that computation really quick. Let's see, 1.2 to the 100 power. Oh, gosh. Okay, that, so this would give us 500 times. Um, let me actually just do it like this. All right. Uh, what this would give us is, so inside scientific notation, I'm just going to round a lot, and I'll just say 4.14 E10, right? So let's see, E9 would be a billion. So this is 41 billion, 400 million, and then there's the 100, the, uh, yeah. yes, that's right. So there'd be this many fish, okay? Uh, that's a lot of fish, and likely um, the model's no longer accurate in 100 years, right? So anyway, that's the difference between something mathematically versus something in your model scientifically. Uh, Mathematically, the domain just keeps on going, but in your model, you might specify something else. And this is where I think it's a little bit silly for this class to get into the math definition versus just uh, giving a model, specifying when it's good, and then asking, you know, it's so like, what's the name for this mathematically? What's the domain? Okay, what's the range mathematically? Well, if you were to graph this, it's exponential growth. It just kind of, whoo, goes crazy. And right here is 500. Okay. Um, so the range, the range refers to all the y values that you could hit uh, within your domain. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Mathematically, the domain of this function, sorry, sorry, sorry. The domain of this function is actually minus infinity to infinity. Okay, uh, you can plug in 
any number you want for t, and this will give you a number. Mathematically, it will make sense. But to talk about negative infinite time, a um, little tricky, okay? A uh, little thing called a Big Bang. Good luck rewinding past that and having any model that works. So, um, anyway. Sorry, so mathematically, what's the range? Oh, well, that's all the different y values you could hit for all possible time. So that'd be anything from zero, which it turns out we can't touch. So we do this curvy bracket up to infinity, which you also can't touch. That's just the concept. Okay, so mathematically, the range is all these different y values. But what would happen in real life? Um, well, in real life, you, uh, we don't really care about zero fish. We care about the initial population. That was 500, and you do touch it. So we have this square bracket. And I suppose it could still go off, but likely you're going to hit some kind of carrying capacity. Okay? Carrying capacity. And so we would not expect exponential growth forever. We would expect to kind of just level off. Um, a lake can only support so many fish. So um, here's a better model, and it's gross, all right? And part of why it's gross is because this is telling us the number of fish. So instead of talking about the number of fish, we could talk about the number of thousands of fish, which just means we divide all these numbers by a thousand, essentially. So we can make that model look like this, which is maybe slightly nicer. Um, the graph is a little bit nicer. So here it is. And so realize, you know, this is actually 10,000 fish. This is 2,000 fish. And this here at one half is actually 500 fish, but it's one half of a thousand. Right? So anyway, here's a better model. And mathematically speaking, the domain is still all real numbers. We could rewind time as far as we want, but scientifically speaking, uh, the domain would be from zero out to, and now we could go to infinity because we've taken into account the carrying capacity of the lake. It's sort of going to level off. And so notice, as time marches on, as time goes off to infinity, my population approaches 10,000, okay? Uh, that's this horizontal asymptote here. Um, this is a brief aside, but a horizontal asymptote is taking uh, your input to either plus or minus infinity, okay? That's how you check for a horizontal asymptote. You, you sort of think about what happens in these scenarios and whether or not you approach one fixed number which for now, I'm just going to look at the graph and I'm going to say, yeah, we're, we're approaching the number 10, which corresponds to 10,000 fish. Anyway, okay, what's the point of all this? The point is that the notions of domain and range in the real world have to do with what inputs can you put in your model, that's the domain, and what type of projections does your model make? Here's your, your projections. And that's your range, okay? So now mathematically, uh, we could ask, like, what are all the possible inputs? That's called the domain. And it turns out they don't really uh, ask about the range, but uh, whatever. All right, so you could graph this. Um, I'm not going to. I'm just going to say that when it comes to domain questions, uh, there's a few little tricks. So if you have a division of some kind of polynomial, I'm just going to use x minus a, the simplest polynomial, um, simplest non-constant, whatever. Uh, here, we just can't divide by zero, which means x can't be a. So we sort of know by looking at this that x should not be eight, okay? And you sort of wonder, well, can it be anything else? Okay, so this is one thing to keep in mind for domain. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you take the square root of something, okay, you, you want that to be positive or technically non-negative. Same with logs, it turns out. So when you take the log of something, you want that something in there to be non-negative. And um, I'll leave it at that rather than explain a bit more about why. Uh, but back to the problem, if I'm trying to find the domain of this monster, then I ask myself, okay, well, the stuff inside, this needs to be greater or equal to zero. So let's think about when is this quantity greater or equal to zero. That's kind of a tricky question. So um, here's a method we can do to organize our thoughts. 
So there's sort of something magical happens at eight. Uh, the magical thing is that you're going to get, uh, well, I guess it'd be six divided by zero, which is undefined. Okay. And another magical thing happens at two. And in that case, you're going to get zero over negative six, better known as zero. So here that this quantity is zero. And here, I'm just going to put down infinity, but we could just say undefined. Okay, that's, oh, I should be more rigorous. Fine, it's undefined. Infinity is not a valid. Okay, fine. And now the idea is, look, if I had to, so right here is going to be zero. And if I have my pin, and I start here in the positive numbers, and I want to wander on down to the negative numbers, eventually I have to cross zero if I'm going to do this continuously. Okay. And so the whole idea is in this region over here, to the left of 2, <laughs> this computation is either positive or negative. But it's a continuous computation, so it's not going to spontaneously change sign. So pick an x value that is less than 2. I'm going to use x equals 0 and plug it in. Okay, x equals 0, we plug it in. We have negative 2 over negative 8. That's a positive number. And it turns out any number you plug in less than 2, this computation is going to give you a positive number. On this entire interval here, that thing is positive. So now let's just test by plugging in some kind of x value between 2 and 8. I'll do 5. Okay. So let's plug in 5. Uh, 5 minus 2 is 3. 5 minus 8 is minus 3. This is negative. And so it turns out anywhere on this interval, you're going to be negative. And you could play the game over here. Um, just imagine a super big x, super duper big, then super duper big number minus 2, that's still some big positive number. Super duper big number minus 8, that's still some big positive number. So I have a positive number over a positive number, that's a positive number. So we're going to be positive over here. All right, so what is the domain of this thing? Well, uh, let me put this away. All right. Well, this interval is okay. That's the interval from minus infinity up to 2. All right, can I touch minus infinity? No, it's not a number, it's just an idea. The idea is keep moving left. All right, can I touch 2? What do I mean by that? I mean, can I plug in x equals 2? Yes, I can. That, that's when I get 0. Okay, I can plug this in, so I do a square bracket. Okay, then I do a capital U, um, which is a little confusing because that doesn't look like a capital U depending on your font. Um, and that's also not technically what the math thing is, but who cares? That's what WebWork wants, so capital U. All right, now I can pick it back up at 8. Am I allowed to be 8? No, because then I would divide by 0. So I'm not allowed to be 8, so I do a curvy bracket. And I can keep wandering off to infinity, so there we go. Boom. Turns out this is the domain of the function, okay? Uh, anyway, I'm less of a fan of this because this is the math-specific type of questions that don't really matter for biological sciences, okay? What matters more is interpreting models, okay? So that's why I talked about that first. All right, uh, where are we? All right, find the vertical asymptotes. A uh, vertical asymptote is when your output blows up. Uh, you should graph this. It happens at x equals 8 or whatever your corresponding uh, when the denominator is 0, okay? If the function has a horizontal asymptote, give the y value. All right, so um, horizontal asymptote, horizontal asymptote, that's when your input ventures off to infinity or when it ventures off to negative infinity. Okay, so let's think about what happens. Let's do case one first, okay? So um, if x, this thing, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, so uh, imagine it's a billion, okay? Or a billion billion or whatever, okay? It's huge. It's so friggin' big. When you take away two... It's like doing nothing, okay? If you find Jeff Bezos two bucks, he doesn't care, okay? Um, you know, some would say this is why laws aren't actually fair because they, uh, the punishment is uh, not proportional to what you can... It doesn't matter. Anyway, um, similarly, if you find him eight bucks, he doesn't care. If X is extremely large, for all intents and purposes, this is basically like X over X in a square root, Right? A billion minus 2 divided by a billion minus 8 is going to be 0. 0.99999 stuff, okay? It's basically 1. Oh, yeah, x over x, that's basically 1. 
this is the whole idea behind figuring out asymptotes. You just let x grow and see what happens. And in this case, you're going to get 1. And I guess it would be y equals 1. Okay. And that's also true with negative infinity. We would just have negative x over negative x. Um, well, that's kind of a lie. Actually, sorry. It would still be x over x. We would have a negative number over that same negative number. Okay. Anyway, so there's that. Um, all right. And then I've already ranted about these. All right, so let's talk about combining functions. Um, this is all called function composition, and h is my squaring function, and I'm going to square g of x. That is what this is saying to do. So what's g of x? It's x plus 1. All right, so let's square it. So this is one way to do it. Um, look, here's x. Uh, weak, oh, I don't, eh, I don't actually want to make the square. I don't care that much. All right, so uh, that's the idea. Uh, well, all right, I will say we could have, all right, or we can talk about doing h to g of x. What's g of x? It's x plus 1. So what's this? Well, it's x plus 1 squared. So we either think of working from the outside in, right? I did h first. Uh, or we think about working from the inside out, right? So this was g of x. It doesn't matter. We get to the same place. Okay, here we are. Um, now, so that's function composition. You naturally do function composition without thinking about it. Uh, let me convince you. All right, so here's that same fish population model from before. And again, T is years since 2020. All right, so let's say 18 months go by. What's the fish population? Well, you'd probably think to yourself, let's see, 18 months. Um, gosh, that's... 1.5 years. How did we do that? Well, we took the number of months and we divided it by 12. Okay. And then you would put that into the population calculator and we'd have 500 times 1.2 to the 1.5. Cool. Um, well, it turns out this is the time in years. And so we can put that into the population calculator, 500, 1.2 to the m over 12. So anyway, uh, what did I just do <laughs> without saying that I did it? Here's that function p, function p, okay? This first thing, it's a function where if you tell it the number of months, it'll tell you the number of years. So I'm going to call it t. It's a function of m. So t, the time in years, is a function of how many months have gone by. So anyway, um, this right here is P of T of M, okay? And my point is that you will naturally do function composition when you have to connect multiple variables. Let's see it in action. All right, so here, um, temperature will give you the length of something, and that length is equal to 5 plus T over 10, and the length will give you the volume of something. And that volume is equal to 6L cubed. And that volume will give you the mass of something. And that mass is equal to 0.3V. OK. And now, if you just start connecting these things, well, um, the if I went from T to V, then how do I get V? Well, it's 6 times the volume cubed not the volume, sorry, it's 6 times the length cubed. But what's the length? It's this. It's 5. That doesn't look like a 5. It's 5 plus t over 10. This is v. And, well, what's the mass? It's 0.3 times v. So 0.3 times v is equal to 0.3 times blah. And that's the mass. So what is mass as a function of time? Or not time, sorry, temperature. Well, it's 0.3 times 6 times 5 plus t over 10 cubed. Okay. Uh, we're just connecting variables. So how much would it weigh at this? Well, plug it in for the temperature, figure it out. All right, cool. Uh, that is worksheet one. And let's see, what are some questions I like? I do really like this question um, because it gets at, like, what's really going on with function composition is connecting um, variables, which we're going to want to do all the time in science. So I like this question. Uh, what else do I like? 
that I've sort of highlighted. I don't like this question. Okay, I don't like that one. Um, this question, it's okay. It's okay. I kind of prefer this one. Uh, this is, so part two is a better understanding of the concepts in the sense that like there's a lot of subtlety going on, but I also consider it kind of a trick question. So um, I feel like since I'm not giving you enough information and you have to sort of read my mind and anticipate, that's sort of unfair. So if something like this would ever appear in your future, I would only have that part, but that's a big if. Um, yeah, so I don't know. This is why I didn't spend too much time on this material. I don't like it very much, but I do really like this thing. So anyway, okay, I'll see you next time for worksheet two.